We are in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, and we're facing another crisis, one related to racism and injustice. But crisis signifies more than just calamity. The word crisis primarily means judgment. We will be judged by our response or our silence to what's happening around us. We know the names. We're encouraged to say them out loud. Eric Garner in New York, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Ahmad Arbery in Brunswick, Georgia. And it's now almost two weeks of protest marches since the May 25th death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Today is the Feast of Pentecost in the Orthodox Church, the day when the spirit of truth and peace or transparency and reconciliation descended on the disciples of Christ. Thank you for joining us at this initiative of the Department of Inter-Orthodox, Ecumenical and Interfaith Relations of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. I'm very grateful, very excited to be speaking with three distinguished Orthodox scholars. Sarah Riccardi Swartz holds a PhD from New York University. She's a sociocultural anthropologist and a historian who works on American religion, social politics, and gender. Over the next year, she will be a postdoctoral fellow in a project of the Center for Religion and Conflict at Arizona State University. The name of the project is Recovering Truth, Religion, Journalism, and Democracy in a Post-Truth Era. Sarah is interested in how media and theology are complicit in the expansion and or demise of democracy. Aristotle Papanicolaou, who also goes by Telly, is professor of theology and culture and co-director of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University. He is also senior fellow at the Emory University Center for the Study of Law and Religion. His books include Being with God, Trinity, Apophaticism, and Divine Human Communion, and The Mystical as Political, Democracy and Non-Radical Orthodoxy. And uh, Candace Lucchese, a PhD from the University of California in Berkeley, She's a sociocultural anthropologist who works on religion and migration and race. She's a convert to the Coptic Orthodox Church. And over the next two years, she will be a postdoctoral fellow at the John Danforth Center at Washington University in St. Louis. Her first book project examines how American religio-political focus on the persecution of Middle Eastern Christians has transformed Coptic Christian identity in an era of migration to the US. So welcome to all of you. And let me begin by asking you all for a very general response. How have you reacted to the recent tragedies and protests against racism? Sarah. My first reaction was really one of deep sadness. Um, followed by a prayerful hope that we as a nation will finally wake up to the systemic violence and racism that has historically been perpetrated against our black brothers and sisters. I know that there are some among us who have already been out um, among the protests, especially Candace, so I'm sure she can speak more to what she's been doing since these events and how she's reacted to them. Yes, Candace, tell us about your reaction and your participation in the march here at Buffalo. Yeah, I think that my reaction has been um, both a hopeful one. I'm I'm incredibly um, taken aback by how broad this movement um, has been um, in comparison to um, past actions um, when um, Black folks have been have been murdered by the police. Um, and that's been a, a source of, of, of great hope for me. Um, but also it's been a source of anger as well, um, just because of the 
I think in the midst of uh, the COVID-19 crisis um, and our, being so isolated um, from uh, those that we organize with, um, or even just having these kind of conversations in person, um, the impact of that, of seeing that video um, and the kind of broader um, national conversation uh, really has uh, brought out different sides of, of people. Um, and I was involved in the protest in Oakland, California a couple of weeks ago, and then also in Buffalo, New York more recently. Um, and, you know, I've seen a range of, of different actions, um, you know, both more aggressive in nature and more peaceful. Um, and I think that uh, both of those come from a space of deep hurt um, and, and deep anger at the kind of the ways in which um, this particular level of um, systemic like, racism has, has uh, gone on, right, without a kind of broader conversation and broader action. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to come back to some of these uh, points that you made. Uh, Telly, what about you? Uh, same. Uh, uh, sadness, frustration, uh, anger, uh, just uh, bewilderment that um, um, it keeps happening and happening. Um, but also I was worried. I was worried that, again that the Orthodox churches wouldn't rise to the occasion in terms of responding to uh, what's been happening and especially with the protests that occurred afterwards. Um, but that's why, uh, that's why you know, the, the presence of Archbishop Apilofotos in Brooklyn was really, um, uh, really very powerful and very necessary. And uh, I know it got international attention within the Orthodox world as well. And it was very um, gratifying right, to see him in the midst of that and to, to see that he was, uh, you know, sort of sending a message of um, hopefully inspiration to other Orthodox Christians to, you know, join in solidarity, um, you know, to bring awareness to really, uh, again, what, what, what Sarah already said is, is really a, a systemic issue, right? Not, uh, not just a few bad apples, or, but really something that we need to really think about structural change, structural reform. We're, we're obviously missing something within American society if this keeps happening over and over and over again. So. I agree with you. And uh, I want to talk about the role of Archbishop Philippe the Fortis as well, a very powerful symbolic uh, gesture uh, of support. Um, but I, I think you're right, there is something unique about this movement, uh, that the, the, for just the fact that it's lasting so long, in fact, intensifying, in fact, expanding all over the world. My own um, uh, country of birth, Australia, we have you no know, huge protests um, and marches in Brisbane, in Sydney, in Melbourne, tens of thousands of people. Um, to focusing on America, but also becoming, uh, voicing their uh, protest about the situation in Australia with the indigenous peoples. Let, let me, before we sort of get too far into this, uh, I know that many people think of this as uh, a possibly a deflection from the primary sort of goal um, here, but um, Candace mentioned uh, deep anger and uh, deep hurt, uh, a, a sense of righteous anger that many Christians are not sure what to make of, even in their own spiritual lives. So let me ask you, because this is an issue that comes up, uh, how do we responsibly account for the breaking of windows, the burning of property, the looting of um, small businesses many times that have accompanied for the most part, very peaceful demonstrations, but that make some people hesitant to throw their full support behind the protests. How do you respond to that? Maybe, Candace, you first mentioned this deep hurt and deep anger. Yeah, um, well, I would first wanna say, I think my main point would be that, um, so this violence is very uh, much focused on by, by the media, right? Um, but the kind of more subtle, insidious forms of, of structural violence that happen to um, Black communities and also other communities of color 
um, is less focused on, right? Because it's not an immediate thing. It's not the breaking of glass. It's not the stealing of, it's not the kind of image of the stealing of the small, you know, things from the small business, right? Um, but, you know, in terms of, kind of corporate greed, for example, or the ways in which like these communities have been uh, subtly looted uh, for, for, for generations. Um, and also, you know, the, the ways that uh, black folks in this country uh, built it uh, without getting paid, uh, right, as, as a slave labor. Um, so we need to kind of, I think, you know, reconfigure our, our framing of uh, the focusing on, on looting and violence, right? Because you do have these communities that have experienced decades, decades of, of looting within their own communities, right? Um, subtly, uh, overtly, and covertly. Uh, and so that's what I want to kind of focus on is kind of a repositioning of the frame, right? And I know that it's an emphasis of all of our churches to focus on like, you know, peaceful protest, right? That this is peaceful, it's nonviolent, and that's important. Um, but I also think we should be a little bit more understanding um, to the folks uh, that have engaged uh, in those particular activities, because um, I don't think for any of us, even on this call, that we can understand what it's like to to be black in America, um, and that I'll start with that. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. What do you think? Uh, I I completely agree with Candace, and I think that the question, which has been all over social media, what about the violence, really needs to be. Um, extended it into a longer question, what about the violence that has continued unchecked against black communities throughout the U.S.? I mean, if we look at American history, slaves were officially emancipated in 1863 and the Civil Rights Act was signed in 1964, and yet the, the violence against black bodies continues. And at some point, the response is going to boil over, and we have to be prayerfully mindful of that response as part of the long history of violence that the black community has experienced. We also have to think about Jesus himself went into the temple and cleansed the merchants and the money changers. Um, he overturned tables, he protested. Um, and if he's our model, we see a protest there already. So um, I, I, you know, I, I agree with Candace completely on this. And I think that the the question really needs reframing, and, and if we can do that gently in the church, that's great. If we have to take a firmer stand, I think that then we need to. Aristotle? Yeah, my feeling is that um, we have to be careful uh, with these whataboutisms. I see them all the time. And um, I, of course, the, in the Orthodox Church and Orthodox theology, we, uh, you know, we, we speak against violence. And of course, and uh, violence against anyone. Um, so, but this whataboutism is a way I think of of deflecting. Um, it's it's a strange kind of equalizer that allows you then to justify other things. And the issue here is the disproportionality across the board of of so many things in terms of uh, violence. I mean, if 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 in terms of disproportionality, I mean, who suffers violence in this country? Again, I, I want to be hesitant there because I don't want that to uh, indicate that we should not necessarily focus on the kind of violence perhaps suffered by uh, police or, or uh, other, you know, people within this country or around the world. Um, but, I mean, you know, this, we have to stick to the, to, to the issue here. And which doesn't mean that we necessarily neglect um, addressing other forms of violence. But there is a certain kind of prioritization here. There is a certain kind of urgency here. There is a certain uh, a necessity here to address uh, something that uh, seems to be uh, failed to be addressed. And uh, I mean, that's the kind of the disproportionality across the board, and especially in terms of who suffers the violence in this country. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, this whataboutism I, I've noticed on various um, you know, social medias and, and in other forms seems to be kind of the go-to and it's it's the same what aboutism that occurred you know that ultimately was um you know was was ultimately voiced to to the civil rights movement as well so there's always a kind of what aboutism and if if somehow we allowed that uh to you know uh, uh, shape 
uh, the way we view the situation, then ultimately there would be no meaningful change. Thank you. No, I agree. And uh, I think uh, also what, what Sarah said is, is so important as well. We're afraid of this um, uh, anger, um, of this uh, even violence. I mean, the ascetic fathers talk about it, you know, asceticism as a violence against the fallen nature. Mm. Um, um, hopefully it's a stage. Hopefully it's a phase, you know, like the stages of, you know, denial and anger and so forth. Um, but it's probably not a bad thing to look at it sort of in the face as well, as you've all said. So, so then what becomes your hope for what can come out of these protests for racial justice? I mean, generally, but more specifically for us as Orthodox Christians, what is it that you hope uh, will uh, emerge as a result of what's happening? We'll start with Sarah. Well, I think we've seen so many of our hierarchs and uh, leadership decrying racism as a heresy. And we all know that that's true, but I think that there must be action. There must be action on the part of hierarchs, um, action at the local level in parishes, through reconciliation, community activism, outreach. And we also have to have that action at the local level uh, within ourselves as individuals to call out racism, to not be afraid to call it out when we see it, to uproot it, um, even when it's difficult and painful. Um, and we need to bring not only our faith into the public square in action, but our voices and our bodies and our resources. We really need to get up off of our knees and get our boots on the ground in a concerted effort to actually create the social transfiguration of culture that we really hope for and that our faith calls for. Uh, Candace? I mean, I would definitely agree with Sarah 100%. I do think that, um, I do think that there needs to be more structure uh, at, especially for, um, for example, I'm a part of the, uh, the Coptic Orthodox Church. I, I sincerely apologize. Uh, I have a dog right now, so I'm going to, I'm going well, to right. um, pass to Telly for one moment. Okay, so yeah, I can... No problem. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's Aristotle, that's look, important too. Did, that's a part of the Christian uh, witness to take care yeah, of the dog. Exactly. So, um, um, I, I wanted to ask uh, Aristotle, what Orthodox Christians, theologians especially, of course, love to speak of liturgy and mysticism and asceticism and spirituality. You write a lot about theosis. Mm -hmm. What does social justice look like for an Orthodox Christian when these terms, uh, when these concepts are translated for the world? How can they transform the world? Well, so I would want, I think, first of all, I, you know, to think about them in terms of asceticism and theosis would reframe um, the question, right? Instead of making it in terms of do's and don'ts, um, in, I, I, you know, I, I want to, one of the things I, I kind of think about is what, what, what is it about who we are that we find this resistance to actually becoming more active, right? We find this resistance to, I mean, cognitively, I think most, I actually think most Orthodox Christians cognitively are against racism. I mean, they see it as a wrong and yet there's a kind of, uh, you don't, you, you see a kind of resistance in many ways to perhaps taking the next step. And I, I think that, I mean, becoming more aware a little bit of that resistance is part of actually the spiritual struggle. So in other words, to see, uh, to see activism, right, uh, to become somehow active in your society, in your political space, to try to make things better for others. Um, and of course, with discernment, right, as well. I think personally in these protests, it requires a great deal of discernment to kind of figure out, it required a great deal of discernment, like to just figure out and make sense of how to be involved, how to get involved, how to jump in. I mean, what to make of the rioting and the looting and other things. Um, but, you know, but, but it's a, it takes a great deal of spiritual strength, I think, um, to first of all, notice and to become more aware of oneself and, on, on one's spiritual journey. Uh, about why it is that somehow I'm constantly throwing up uh, uh, barriers. Uh, you know, why am I somehow, you know, engaging in whataboutism or um, why am I somehow cognitively um, 
sort of agreeing that racism is wrong, but somehow not doing more to, to figure out what's going on and why there's this, this incredible disproportionality in terms of healthcare, violence, um, income, and, and, and many other factors, uh, incarceration. Um, and I, you know, that, that, that to me is why asceticism is in many ways, or can be political. Because you know, when you're thrown into these kinds of political realities, it really forces you to reflect um, on your response. And I think it, requir it requires a great deal of spiritual strength. So what I, what I hope for, what I hope for is to see, uh, to, to reframe uh, our response in many ways as part of our spirituality, uh, as part of our journey towards theosis, towards deification. And to really understand theosis, not simply, and I've written about this, as you know, not simply understand it as this kind of unreachable sort of feeding of the animals in the forest, the way, you know, Seraphim, St. Seraphim, Seraphim, Seraphim of Seraph does and others, but really as a kind of worldly manifestation uh, and reality, uh, something that, that really occurs in the midst of uh, sort of the muck of the world, and and right now we're, we're that's what we're experiencing in, in so many different kinds of forms. I agree. And ultimately, to truly to truly think about and what is it? What is it? How can I kind of move towards being the kind of person that's not afraid, right? That's not afraid to somehow speak out, um, perhaps donate, but even more powerfully to really uh, put oneself out there in solidarity. Uh, to uh, to work towards structural change. So, thank you, uh, Candice. Um, before your dog protested peacefully, um, what's your dog's name? <laughs> Je Jeter. Jeter. Okay. Derek Jeter. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to go down that road at <laughs> all. Um, <laughs> um, you, you were saying something, and um, yeah. moved away, but I, I wanted to know what your hope is that what might come out of this for the Orthodox Church, uh, for our churches, talking about race is not the sort of thing we do easily or commonly. Um, so what is it that this can um, help us to do in our churches? Well, um, as I was about to say, I sure hope that um, that this will lead to greater institutional involvement in um, kind of facilitating conversations. So, you know, I'm obviously speaking from the Coptic Orthodox perspective and other Oriental Orthodox churches as well, mm -hmm. um, specifically because the Oriental Orthodox churches are, you know, more recent immigrants um, for the most part. And they face, you know, very different circumstances than uh, many of our brothers and sisters in the Eastern Orthodox churches. And um, I think that it's really important to kind of facilitate those conversations because they're happening uh, amongst younger cops, the younger generations. And the church needs to kind of take a more forceful step forward to be the facilitator. Um, to say that this is what our position is. And not to simply, you know, put out particular statements because everybody else is, right? Departments and companies and whatever else, right? Statements of substance, right? That are saying, this is what we're going to do. Um, this is our position on this. We understand our, you know, communities are also, you know, a part of these protests or having these conversations. Um, I think it's about being honest with ourselves. Um, honest with ourselves as academics as to how we participate um, in these structures of oppression, quite frankly, and structures of racism, um, particularly as white academics. Uh, and, you know, that means giving, you know, s opening up spaces for folks that are marginalized within our communities, even within the Coptic Orthodox Church, whether it's, you know, Sudanese Copts or Ethiopians or whoever else. D tell us a little bit about the experience of the Copts. What sort of tensions have they encountered here in the States? And how have religious differences between, say, Christians and Muslims exacerbated those differences? 
Sure. Um, you know, that's a big question. Uh, so I'll try to give as concise an answer as possible. But, um, you know, post-1965 immigration, right, cops are definitely a part of that particular uh, wave, right? Um, and, you know, within that wave, there, there is a particular concept of the model minority, right, of becoming a community that achieves the American dream, um, that doesn't ruffle, you know, anybody's feathers, uh, that is, you know, financially successful, um, is, you know, uh, uh, socially su is successful, et cetera, right? Um, you know, over the past 30 years, there have been different waves of cops that have come to the United States. Coptic Christians are, as of 2018, the highest recipients of the green card lottery, for example, which has brought um, different kind of classes of cops to the United States, creating certain tensions, right, that have also brought to the fore not only generational tensions, um, but also political tensions as well. Um, and, you know, cops are as diverse as any other community, politically, uh, even racially, economically, um, and so their experience is a diverse one, but it is also one uh, by which the Coptic community is also a community of color um, that has had to deal with, and they're having these conversations right now, has had to deal with various levels of colorism in their community, anti-Black racism, et cetera. Um, one of the main uh, points that I want to emphasize is that a lot of these discussions that are happening now are also um, a result of uh, kind of the politics of home, right? That the Coptic Orthodox Church in the United States um, still has a reference point back to Egypt. And this is um, a major issue for uh, many of the younger generations that, that understand themselves to be Americans, right? And are operating within this context um, and not the Egyptian national and political context, right? Um, and to get to your final question on kind of Muslim Christian relations, one of the things that I look at in my work is really to think about the ways that after 9-11, even before 9-11, but specifically after 9-11, um, the ways that cops have been interpolated into the kind of figure of the Muslim in, in the United States um, and how in order to avoid racialization and securitization um, as being uh, depicted as like Muslim adjacent, um, you know, cops have tried to say we are Christians and emphasize their Christianity, um, whether that is in changing, you know, names, appearances. This has happened for a number of immigrant communities, including the Greeks themselves, right? Um, and it is a function of race in, in the United States. So what happened after 9-11 is also a function of the black-white binary in the United States too, of trying to achieve whiteness, um, but not always successfully doing so like, uh, like Poles or Irish or Jews or Italians or even Greeks now. Um, so I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to come back to one of those points as well in a moment, but um, Several of you have now mentioned the, the stand of the church, the statements uh, of the church. Um, so let's talk about leadership without putting you on a spot here. But in the Old Testament, prophets were people who scarified society for its misdirected values. Uh, do you think our churches today, our churches, the Orthodox churches, are standing up to or not their vocation? Has their response been adequate? So we mentioned Archbishop Elpidophoros earlier, who took a public stance, and just a couple of years ago, uh, Archbishop Demetrius marched in Alabama with President Obama to mark the 50th anniversary since Martin Luther King's march on Selma. But in general, we don't see too much of this kind of initiative by Orthodox leaders. Sarah, why do you think that is? Well, I think that... You know, this, this question is really complicated. Um, at the very least, I think it suggests that many of the hierarchs across the jurisdictions are quite simply out of touch with longstanding social issues that have theological implications for both their flocks, but also for broader society. And I think at the very worst that their silence suggests complicity in the institutional forms of racism that are really embedded in the American ethos and the way of life. 
So I think we, we really have to ask ourselves, that's probably the, probably the most important question you've raised so far, fathers. Why, why isn't the, the American Orthodox leadership uh, standing up and, and, and proclaiming not only that racism is a heresy, but that their flock has to do something about it and that they need to do something about it? So let me take you one step further then. Uh, you've mentioned uh, maybe there's something complicit here, not just in you know, our leaders, but in, you know, among the very faithful in um, the Orthodox Church, because we don't. We have to admit, we, we love to rest on our laurels that Iakovos marched with MLK. Uh, but the truth is, nobody supported Iakovos within the Greek Orthodox Church at the time. He was on his own. Um, and I think he wasn't 100% sure either. So if we take this one step further, uh, Sarah, how do you see whiteness and racism reflected in the immigrant Orthodox communities? Um, what's our, what should be our response uh, mm -hmm. to white supremacy? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, our response to white supremacy should always be a firm no and get out. Um, but as, from the vantage point of an anthropologist, I see racism in these Orthodox communities as really, as Candace already mentioned, in, in the Coptic communities, bound up with sort of notions of whiteness, right? And I see in Orthodox communities two, a two-part issue surrounding whiteness. Um, we know that much of Orthodoxy in the United States is made up of immigrant communities who went through this process of American acculturation. They went through the process of whitening for the sake of social and religious acceptability. And I really see that as an issue that's still embedded in the cultural psyches and the formations of Orthodox broadly across the US. And then secondly, we also have these deep racial tensions that surround this idea of white privilege um, or being a white oppressor. And we see this emerging in the backlash against protesters um, in the social media of some Orthodox Christians that I've encountered. And scholars have really suggested that this white power really cultivates its power through appearing as nothing. It just is. It's there. It's unmarked as a category. And I see that as particularly actually true in the, the Orthodox Christian circles. Um, race is a cultural construct that is sinister. And white Americans have this sort of possessive investment in preserving their whiteness. And we really see this in response to Black Lives Matter. Um, when Orthodox Christians are responding that all lives matter or that police lives matter, we see that, that possessive whiteness. And, and certainly Telly and George have pointed out in their most recent article, their fabulous article for public orthodoxy, that all lives, of course, do matter. But the problem with that sentiment, um, especially the sentiment of police lives matter, is that it, for me, it diminishes that systematic violence against and that murder of black people in the United States. And we know, Father John, that the US was founded on stolen native, we're all on stolen native land right now. And it was built up by the work of slaves. And we see in the 19th and 20th century, the sort of curation of an American ethos that was for and by white people. And now we had, of course, the civil rights movement with MLK. And we have increasing social equality now, but as a nation, we still continue to marginalize black people. And that's in higher education, that's in politics, and that is certainly in the Orthodox Church. And so what can we do, right? That is the, that is the pressing and hard question to push back against that. And I would say one of the things we need to do in Orthodoxy is write our bishops, write our clerics, and tell them to, to be vocal and to be adamant against racism and in active, true ways, not just in words. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, that's why I asked earlier, what is your vision of hope for uh, what's happening? Um, Aristotle uh, Telly, sorry, you've, you've written uh, and spoken about racial imagination. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah. Um, before I get to that, though, let me just comment on the um, uh, Archbishop Yakovos, sort of the, the visual imagery of the pictures that always get shown around that time. I mean, it's it's a sort of a um, it's I I agree with those who kind of will indicate that you know this is kind of a tokenism, etc. But so I agree with that. At the same time, 
I, I'm very much in favor of constantly showing those images. And now we're going to have the images of Archbishop of the photos, which went international um, in a way that Archbishop Yakovus's didn't, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of constantly showing those because it, I think what people are doing when they're showing them is pointing to what we should be doing, <laughs> right? I so I, I would be more worried if people weren't showing them. I agree. Uh, hopefully we'll I, have I, more I, images. I, I so could actually we'll have more. I, uh, I um, would say, Tilly, that um, I always say, and I did not want to, um, you know, denigrate his um, action at all. If I always say, if Yakovos had done nothing else for the right. church in America and right. the world, this alone would be enough for a legacy. So right. Right. I agree wholeheartedly. Right. And, we are the church of icons, all right? So yeah. icons make a big difference. Right, and that has become iconic. Mm -hmm. um, so I am... Um, in terms of racial imagination, I mean, really, again, uh, uh, to think about it in terms of our spiritual journey, again, we, as Orthodox, it's, it's not, you know, God is in a checklist, you know, we're not, we shouldn't make sort of our, our response to racial injustice as a checklist, you know, check, I, I went out and protested. Um, I, it's more of a sense of, of really, um, uh, you know, having a kind of relationship with God that ultimately uh, allows for discernment, faith, uh, over fear, uh, strength, um, and a certain amount of solidarity. I mean, seeing others. But the racial imagination in particular, it, what I mean by that is having a, a real sense, kind of an imagination of what it's like to be in a black body. Um, and this is where, um, you know, one way to do that is just to really kind of self-reflect and realize, especially, let's say, for me now, as an example, as a white male, it doesn't get any more privileged than that. Uh, as a white male, that I, I didn't have to uh, get educated about um, uh, worrying about how to deal with the police if they pull you over. I don't have to look over my shoulders. Um, my co recently, my colleague, uh, you know, we were talking, uh, Rufus Burnett, and we were talking, and he has a young daughter, and, 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 and he was sort of speaking about how he hopes his young daughter doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have to you know, ultimately um, be on the wrong side of violence, let's say. Um, and he's thinking about that. He's thinking about that. And I, I never had to think about that with my kids. I had to think about well, other things with two male boys, about other things, but never really to think about them being out in the world and, and educating them about how to, to, to live in those bodies and to kind of react. And, and so in some sense, to, 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 to really uh, move spiritually, in our journey of deification to have a sense of what it's like to be in that kind of body, what it's like to live in that kind of body and to experience again, the various forms of disproportionality across the board and to negotiate those. And, and even more so in the United States to really negotiate. I mean, many people, when they speak about slavery, they think about, um, they say, Oh, well, we're over that and so on and so forth. Right. I mean, it, it's amazing for me that the Greeks say that when the Greeks haven't even, gone over the Ottoman occupation yet, right? I mean, they, I mean, I, I grew up memorizing poems about the Turks and how bad the Turks were. And, and, and it's amazing to me that Greeks will kind of, in one of the same, you know, kind of voice, uh, basically, you know, constantly bring up that memory. And then when it comes to slavery, oh, well, you know, we're over that. When in fact, this country you know, there's this whole New York Times 1619 project, and I know it's controversial. I, I don't want to get into the details of that controversy, but it's absolutely indisputable uh, that, you know, slavery has been, from the beginning of the foundation of this country, a reality. So, you know, whether it's constitutive and all that other kind of debate that's going on, I'm not going to get into that so much, as, but simply as to say that whatever the results of that debate, whatever the conclusions are, you know, African Americans within this country, you know, live with a history of never being quite welcomed. Right. So, and, and whatever, you know, the discrimination the Greeks went through, and they did, and many other immigrant communities, and so on and so forth, eventually, they were welcomed. <laughs> well, racial imagination is exactly why Iakovos got it. Right. And he he and said, right. I, I know this, I've seen this, I've experienced this on my own island. Uh, in Turkey. So. And El Pilofotos as well. 
I mean, exactly, very much so. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I do want to wrap up, but there's something that um, sort of uh, struck me uh, as all of you were speaking, and um, Candace uh, certainly mentioned this. I wonder if you might agree or disagree, just very briefly. But um, I honestly have been thinking over the last couple of weeks whether the Orthodox Church can be true to its vocation in this country if it doesn't deal with these issues. No matter how well it deals with its mother churches, with its uh, interrelationship among the autocephalous churches, among its hierarchy and um, among the parishes that it tries to um, you know, blossom uh, with its uh, you know, huge buildings and so forth, and um, affluent for them in many ways, um, Orthodox Christians, certainly in the, the Greek and the Antiochian jurisdiction. Can we really say that we're dealing with what we should be dealing with as Orthodox Christians if we're not talking about these issues? And can we not work on a pan-Orthodox level and even more so, um, Candice, together as with our sister Orthodox uh, Copts and other Oriental Orthodox? Um, should we not be working together on this issue above and beyond all else? Yes. Um, I think that's a very uh, complicated question. Um, I will, I will say this. I do think, um, I do think that um, symbolism is important. You know, I do think that having these conversations are important. I do think having statements are important. I do think attending a protest is important, whatever you can do, right? But it also needs to be a structural thing. So while, yes, I think that the Orthodox Church and Orthodox churches in America do have and should have a role to play, not only for American society at large, but also for our communities, because there are elements within our communities that need guidance, There are elements within our communities that need a voice. Um, So we do not drive them out, quite frankly. Um, And I think that that is something that is of great concern to me within my own church um, and within other churches I know. But one thing I do want to mention, and again, it might be a little bit controversial of a statement, is that if we're going to come together as the Orthodox Church, Orthodox churches in America, to combat this, right? There needs to be also an honest dialogue as well between Eastern and Oriental churches in in the sense that um, there needs to be a doing away of discussions of um, of uh, ranking. You know, uh, these are these churches, the Oriental Orthodox are not as theologically sophisticated or whatever else that needs to be done away with. And there needs to be a real conversation about how to you know, best approach this relationship, right? Because there are a lot of churches of color within the Oriental Orthodox community. Um, and so if we're gonna kind of think about change, we really need to think about what our, what our own problems are within our faith community and how we can bring those to the fore, how we can add to the conversation because we have those communities within our own umbrella, with, under our own umbrella. Um, and I think that's something really important to address. Uh, Sarah, do you have anything to say, uh, even as a closing comment? Oh, I agree with Candace. We we do need that, and also with within within Eastern Orthodoxy, we also need to uh, be reflexive and look at the own issues that are plugging plugging our churches. Um, and specifically, we need to think about how Orthodoxy is changing because of the influx of converts and what that means for sort of the social and political ethos of Eastern Orthodoxy before we can even start having conversations with Oriental Orthodox churches. We need to, we need to fix our own mess first, right, essentially. Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, all three of you, Sarah Riccardi Swartz, uh, Aristotle Pepe Nicolau, and Candice Lukasik. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for your uh, thoughts. I honestly hope that this is a beginning Uh, to a very important conversation in our church. So thank you, and my thanks to all of you for watching and listening to this program.